you know, Panasha and, and Deepak, thanks for, for joining me. Deepak, let's start with the Chopra Foundation. You know, many are familiar with you, with, with your books. Um, give a sense of, of why you started the foundation and what its sort of goals and objectives. Well, historically, uh, I had founded something else about 30 years ago, or maybe less. It was called Alliance for a New Humanity. And the vision was uh, the vision that is now the vision of the Chopra Foundation. Uh, when I started that organization, there were people from the UN, there were some people uh, like Oscar Arias, uh, the former president of Costa Rica, Nobel Prize winner. There were journalists. Unfortunately, because of the international nature of the organization, it didn't survive. So I took the mission that I originally had, which was to reach a critical mass of consciousness for a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful world. And I decided that to create, to have that as the vision of the Chopra Foundation. Because there's always a problem in fundraising for nonprofits, especially when you have such a vision that most people didn't realize that those words were chosen very carefully. Peace, justice, sustainability, health, and joy, very carefully chosen, because right now that's the crisis in the world. You know, look at what's happening in Gaza, look at what's happening in Ukraine, look at what's happening in Afghanistan, name it, anywhere, right, in the Middle East. And uh, for some reason, human beings are so conditioned to solve problems by violence, and all these things are connected, justice, social justice, economic justice, climate change, uh, and our relationship with each other, they're all connected. And there are solutions to everything. You know, when you look at the science, there's solutions to peace and prosperity, solutions to climate change, solutions to chronic disease, and of course, um, solutions to mental distress, which is another pandemic right now, global. So that was the original goal. But it then actually became some very specific projects. I started something called the Soul of Leadership, which I uh, was teaching at Kellogg Business School for 14 years. I taught uh, Soul of Leadership at uh, Columbia Business School for almost 14 years as well. I did that course for uh, Harvard once before and for other universities or even for the Obama Foundation in Sweden, etc. And then we took that course and we actually legitimized it through technology and AI and you know how we can get feedback from people. But basically the idea to train young people, Gen Z more than anyone else, for the future of leadership in the world, globally. So leadership became a very important part of our thing. And as did uh, mental well-being and conflict resolution and uh, right now the focus is also to bring in sages and scientists together because when you look at these people with such big minds exploring extraterrestrial life looking for you know how to create the software for the Mars landing looking at uh, how to create technology for gene editing uh, CRISPR for example looking at how to prevent Alzheimer's. These are very specific things that can be accomplished right now if we have the conversation with the people who are uh, shepherding this new era. You know, as I look back in the last 10 years, you have gene ed artificial intelligence, you have gene editing, you have messenger RNA, you have the whole revolution on microbiome, the whole revolution of epigenetics, the whole revolution of neuroplasticity. And it's happening as we speak. And as if we expand this conversation uh, with the general public, with professionals, with luminaries, with influencers, with leaders, and also make it available online, I think we have a chance to create a better world. And, you know, at my age, I can't think of doing anything more important than Right, so your legacy of leaving the play, you know, the world a better place uh, than when you when you entered it, and I, I think that's, you know, an amazing sort of objective. You know, Panasha, Deepak mentioned sages and scientists as as a concept, but this is really 
uh, I'll, I'll call it a franchise, a brand that Chopra Foundation is leaning into through events and content. You know, talk about why live events, as Deepak mentioned, technology has democratized the creation and distribution of content. But, you know, there's still a need for putting people in a room together, the serendipity that happens when you when you put them together. So talk a little about the evolution of what Sages and Scientists is and sort of how it's going to you know manifest itself in September uh, up in Boston. I think Dr. Chopra mentioned this, that, you know, one of the challenges we have in the world today is mental health, right? On the foundation side, we're focused on three areas. The first area is the movement called Never Alone, which is focused on mental health and suicide prevention. Mostly, I would say, on mental health and well-being. The second area of focus is longevity and health span. And we have an entire program looking at, as the Western world looks at reverse aging, Dr. Chopra says, how do we have to talk about the vitality, the wisdom of age and the vitality of youth? And we're working with some of the leading technologists out there, like the Human Longevity Institute, the, the team which, uh, which basically worked on the human genome. And the third area which Dr. Chopra should touch upon is the whole area of leadership. And one of the things we, what we feel is that post-pandemic, everything has gone online, but there's a need for us to, we say we are super connected, but very lonely. And the goal is to, can we create these epicenters where people can come together and then take it online? So the goal of the Sages and Scientists Symposium, and, and at reason, reason it's at Harvard, at the iconic Sanders Theater, is to really bring together this critical mass of thought leaders. We talked about the future of well-being, right? Everything from CRISPR to Alzheimer's to mental health, uh, to the latest and greatest technologies and solutions in healthcare. Uh, to talk about humanity, the conversation between AI and consciousness, ethics and AI. How do we look at the new frontiers as humanity kind of dives into it? The third area is the future of the cosmos. Are humans interplanetary? Are we look at lunar, Mars landing? What happens to the evolution of the humans? And so these in interesting conversations are going to happen during Sages and Scientists at Harvard. But more importantly, what I think what I'm excited about is that the format is not one you just speak to a bunch of people and then you just leave, right? You have the world's leading expert and thought leaders who are going to be there, and there's going to be a conversation and community. And when you create a sense of community, then you can go back into the world and go back. It could be in India or the Middle East or back in Africa. You can then go back into your world, and we want to still create these centers. We want to have what I call the mini sages. We're planning one right after sages and scientists in Harvard to sages and scientists in Mallorca. And the focus in Mallorca is going to be about AI and how AI can be used for sustainability. As you know, in Mallorca, Mallorca is challenged with this whole how to create responsible tourism. So as the Mallorcans, the 18, 1 million local Mallorcans and 18 million tourists. And that's not, they're not, they're not the only people who are challenged with this problem. How do you look at AI and technology to address this? So our goal is to look at Harvard, the main one, as an epicenter of people who come together. They kind of go back into the communities. And through the, and using technology, we've always looked at, um, before there was calm, headspace, and inside timer, the meditation experience was a 21-day meditation experience, right, which was really what kicked off the whole meditation movement, I would say. So from our perspective, it's really creating intimacy. Sages and scientists is about creating intimacy and creating community with the right knowledge, education, and awareness. So that's a big vision of why we're doing Sages and Scientists, why we're creating physical events, and then obviously we will democratize access and open it up so that everybody globally can access the information. And it seems like you have you know, a, an amazing group of speakers and luminaries, to your point, that represent really that wide spectrum of uh, mental health, physical health. Um, you know, you've touched a couple times on technology you know, you have Sam Altman, right? So, you know, we, we sort of say we're in this moment of AI where, yes, AI has existed for over a decade, but what ChatGPT and, and has done is open many people's eyes to the power of AI. You know, Dr. Chopra, talk a little about, you know, how AI specifically is interwoven into your thinking around well-being, mindfulness, um, and maybe even beyond that, how leaders you know, then should be balancing, right? Technology, in some cases, we talk about how technology has been a maybe to, at the detriment of teenagers and mental health and isolation, um, but how technology actually could be a, a positive uh, driver for, you know, so, so social progress. So uh, if you look behind me, that my next book, which will be out 
um, before the conference. It's called Digital Dharma, how to use AI to enhance personal well-being and also elevate spiritual intelligence. Sam Altman has given an endorsement. I spoke to Sam yesterday for 20 minutes recording a conversation with him too because there are all these you know, doomsday scenarios about uh, AI as well, how it could be weaponized, etc. And I was very happy to see that he has uh, the genius to think even how AI could be used to prevent the misuse of AI. You know, it can all be programmed, uh, how to prevent the misuse of AI as well. But I personally use AI for four things. One, as a personal confidant for reflection, inquiry, journaling. Number two, as a health coach for mental and physical well-being. Number three, as a research assistant. And number four, believe it or not, as a spiritual guide, because AI gives me access to all the luminaries from Plato to Socrates to Wittgenstein to Schopenhauer to the sages of the Upanishads to all the prophets uh, that have existed in humanity, we have access to large language models. AI is in such an interesting concept because, you know, human civilization is the product of language. Up until 40,000 years ago, uh, we had something, uh, you know, about 40,000 years ago, Homo sapiens took a different path than all the other uh, species, including other hominids by creating language as a tool for communication. So language is what created the human experience. Before language, there was no money, there were no nation states, there were no empires, there was nothing like Wall Street, latitude, longitude, these are human constructs. Now with AI, you have access to multiple language models. So we have access to biological language, the language of physics, the language of mathematics, the language of anthropology, the language of cosmic and biological evolution, the language of uh, spiritual masters, the language of anthropologists. This has, it, it's going to take leapfrog, literally, our evolution as a human species into territory that is unimaginable unimaginable because no human being has access to multiple languages. I have now come to the conclusion we ourselves as a species are a language model. That's who we are. As a homo sapiens, we are a language model. You know, and a language is not necessarily a human creation. It's part of evolution. It's part of biological evolution. That's how it happened. And now we know that language influences gene activity. You know, um, I had a very dramatic uh, incident that I want to share with you. Many years ago, I told a patient, um, I think you might have cancer. And as soon as I said that, I saw his face was crestfallen, his body language changed, his blood pressure went up, inflammatory markers went up. and in the minute after that, I realized it was the wrong chart. And I said, I'm so sorry, that's not you, it was somebody else. And immediately everything changed. So, you know, words and language have made my, my life is a history of selling words. You know, 97 books, that's all I've done, sold words. Now I realize that with the large language models, what we can achieve as the human experience of the universe is leapfrogging and evolutionary wise. So, you know, thanks to Sam and I, you know, collaborating on a few projects, I think he's very well intentioned. He's very smart. He understands the future. And uh, we're all uh, obviously know that any technology can be misused. You use nuclear weapons, you know, nuclear technology, otherwise it's pretty safe and useful, but the diabolical uses of every technology, whether it's biohacking or cyber warfare, and human beings have to evolve. Our emotional and spiritual intelligence has to keep up with our technological intelligence. And if we do that, we indeed have now the wherewithal to create that vision, peace, justice, sustainability, health, and joy for the whole world and it's desperately
Yeah, I think the the ethical and responsible use of technology, right, is is something that that we believe strongly in. Sort of, you know, sort of getting leaders together to to put, you know, how do you put the guidelines in place? Um, I got to interview Arthi Prabhakar, who worked with Biden on the uh, AI guidelines uh, last November, um, and I think. Uh, you know, we've been a huge proponent of, of, you know, tech for good. How do we solve the UN SDGs? How do we, you know, sort of really embrace all technologies um, in, in a way? Um, Punasha, so, you know, again, so as, as someone who's coming to Sages and Scientists in September, you know, what is what, what is your hope? What does success look like? They, they leave the day after uh, walking away, looking back at those two days and saying, you know, saying what, saying that was amazing, obviously the insights, the network, you know, for you, what, what is what is your hope that the attendees will take away? I, th I think one thing they'll definitely take away, I think they'll be inspired, right? That is a given. I think the kind of caliber of people we have talking about the future of the different domains, they'll be inspired for sure. The second thing I think they definitely can take away is making connections. I think we tend to go about life alone. So my goal is that, you know, uh, life is a team sport. Being an entrepreneur is actually very really lonely. You need to find like-minded people. We talk about Sangha. So one of the things that by the design and, the, and the, the programming is for everybody to find the connection within the other, other people. Somebody is amazing. Let's say somebody is working on AI, and they run into you know, Carme Artigas, who is the United Nations uh, AI committee, right? And she talks about how to work on the ethics of AI. So we have people today who they can actually connect and have conversation with. So one is be inspired. Second, find the connection, find the tribe. The third thing which we want, we will be doing at the foundation is continuing to engage them. So we want to champion this, not just a one-off thing, but really creating this as an ongoing year-long engagement where we can track their journey, right? So if you think about it, if you come to the Sages and Scientists Symposium, you will improve your well-being. That's a given. That's what we work on. We're going to improve your health span. Every leader needs that. Third, we're going to make you more conscious as a person. I think the answer to your question previously, one of the things I think about all the time as a technologist, I was an AI programmer in 1992, right? I started up very, very early in, and there was something called CLIP C Lisp. And um, today when I look at it, when, when a physician becomes a doctor, doc, they've taken oath, the Hippocrates oath, right? Well, how come software engineers don't take it? Today software engineers are starting and stopping hearts, right? So today every engineer, every programmer, everybody touches a line of code has a responsibility. I think this is something which we need to relook at the design. But once again, when you talk about this, we have Dava Newman, head of MIT over there, Media Labs, right? We have Bharat Anand from Harvard Business School. We have different uh, academic professionals who are going to be speaking. So I think if you have an idea, if you have a conversation, I think we'll have a com community which you can take away after the summit. Great. Well, Worth is uh, you know proud to be a media partner of Sages and Scientists, excited to continue our, our work together. Um, you know, Dr. Chopra, any any final thoughts on on leadership? We have a lot of leaders in our community. They're struggling with everything from, you know, back to work. How is technology impacting? We're burnt out. You know, we were talking earlier that we're on Zooms back to back to back. You know, any, you know, words of wisdom advice as you're working with many leaders on sort of leadership, you know, to your point, emotional intelligence and artificial intelligence, how do those two even coexist? So first of all, just recognize once a technology is there, it's irreversible, there's no going back. It's like a child that's born, cannot return to the womb. So now how do we adapt to it? And uh, how do we actually maximize the benefit? Darwinian principles say that if we don't adapt, we become extinct. And if we adapt really well, then actually we can take advantage of every new step in the evolution of technology. Coming to um, burnout and mental, uh, mental distress as a result of technology, it's not the fault of technology, it's how we use it. You know, I just attended a, a conference where I had 300 CEOs of hospitals in Baltimore, uh, in Washington, just two weeks ago. And yes, this came up, burnout, etc. came out. And, you know, I have been a victim of that myself during my internship and residency, working long hours. I remember sitting all night reading EKGs and being totally exhausted in the morning. 
and having to drink coffee all night and smoke cigarettes and getting through the night just to read EKGs. Now those same things can be read by this in the fraction of a second. So look at the saving there in terms of labor, etc. I think a lot of burnout occurs because physicians and other healthcare providers are burdened with administrative and financial interests in where, in fact, that should be the job of somebody else. You know, they're filling out forms, this and that. Now technology is going to help us do that. So our soul of leadership is based actually on the acronym LEADERS. L stands for look and listen and create a vision. E stands for emotional intelligence. A stands for expanding awareness and harnessing skills like intuition, creativity, vision, and even transcendence. D stands for dreaming and doing. The next E stands for empowerment. R stands for responsibility. And S, the last letter of the word leaders, stands for synchronicity. Stages and scientists is a place where synchronicity will happen, where people will make alliances. And ultimately, according to social scientists and the research, says no problem is beyond solution if you have shared vision where maximum diversity, um, complementing everyone's strengths and creating an emotional and spiritual community. If we can do that globally, you know, I want to see these, these centers of excellence where you have community service and some kind of bonding happening to solve the big issues of our time locally, regionally, and globally, and perhaps in interstellar space as well. <laughs> so that's the vision.